What keeps an audience invested in a story? A great many things. Intriguing characters, beautiful set pieces, well-choreographed action. But arguably the most effective hook for viewership is tension. Tension is created by having a disconnect between a character's goal or end state and their current situation, with an obstacle in between the two. This evokes feelings of worry, suspense, and curiosity in the viewers getting them emotionally invested in the story. If someone wonders, and more importantly, cares about what will happen next, that person is far more likely to keep watching than a viewer who is not emotionally invested. The building and relieving of tension also keeps a story moving. If there is no sense of anticipation or suspense, the viewer will likely get bored with the story and find something else. There needs to be a constant movement of tension. It needs to ebb and flow much like a tide. Unlike a tide, however, it should not be predictable and consistent. Some points of tension will be resolved within a single scene, some might stretch out for an episode, others can span the entire length of the story, and some should be resolved earlier or later than expected, in ways most viewers would not anticipate. The aim is to use tension to maintain audience investment while avoiding predictability and thus boredom and disinterest. How does tension get built up and relieved? Typically through the anticipation of conflict and the conflict itself. If our hero is about to embark on a dangerous mission and his enemies are preparing the doomsday device he is trying to stop, tension builds as the two sides move along their storylines. Once the hero enters enemy territory, the tension is realized and becomes conflict. It's not that the tension is gone. It's present throughout conflict, but now it is no longer merely an undertone. It is present in the action. But it has reached its apex and plateaued, and is waiting for the conflict to end before it can be relieved. It's worth noting, though, that tension can also be introduced or increased by conflict. A contentious conversation, for example, can build up one point of tension, even if it relieves it in another area. Conflict contributes to both the ebb and the flow of tension, and thus is a central piece of storytelling. So now that we've gotten those central concepts clarified, we have to consider the main question. What makes for good tension? First, intriguing characters. The audience doesn't have to cheer for a particular character. We can be invested in the plans and goals for a villain or anti-hero in addition to those of the hero or protagonist as long as those characters are sufficiently developed, act according to their established personality, and have emotional weight in their story and dialogue. Second, the stakes need to be appropriate and at least somewhat defined. The audience should have an idea of what the consequences will be should the hero or villain fail or succeed in their quests, and the results of failure or success at a given point should match where we are in the story. Third, the conflicts need to suitably address tension. Whether a given scene, conversation, battle, or what have you build up more tension, relieve it somewhat, or resolve it entirely, there needs to be some change in the tension as a result of said conflict. Fourth, the tension should ebb and flow with acceptable pacing. It should not get dragged out, nor should it be resolved in the blink of an eye. The story needs to give the tension time to build, but cannot let it overstay its welcome. And of course, all this needs to be backed up by solid writing, acting, directing, and cinematography. Creating a story with these listed tenets of good, engaging tension is only one part of the process. You need to follow through and execute. So let's take a look at how Andor and Obi-Wan Kenobi handle tension on both the large and small scale. Starting with the wide view, let's examine how these two shows overarching stories build and relieve tension. This is an intriguing comparison because the audience knows that the titular characters will survive. We know when and we know how Cassian Andor and Obi-Wan Kenobi die, thus taking away one common, easily accessible source of suspense. The tension in these shows, then, is more internal and psychological as we watch each protagonist confront obstacles and challenges to become the person we know he becomes. The shows are tasked with building tension by making the audience question not if something will happen, but rather how the protagonist will develop and mature as he is confronted by various external threats. On that front, the Obi-Wan show has a serious advantage over Andor. It's safe to say that, as a whole, the Star Wars fandom cares far more about Obi-Wan stories than they do about Cassian Andor's. Duh. Obi-Wan is one of the best-loved characters in franchise history, so it should be easy to get the audience invested in the story about his years between episodes 3 and 4. The creators of Andor, by contrast, had their work cut out for them. It's not that Cassian was a disliked character in Rogue One, but simply that he was a supporting character in a spin-off movie. That, however great it may have been, simply didn't pull the same weight as the original trilogy or the prequels. However, their arcs do share similarities in that both characters are pulled out of relative isolation and forced into action. 
They both have to discover who they are now, how they fit into the events that are shaping the galaxy. For Obi-Wan, it's a journey of rediscovery and healing. For Cassian, it's an arc defined by learning to look up, to recognize that he cannot merely keep his head down and survive in the Empire's galaxy. The overarching conflict in these shows, then, is man versus self. Obviously, there is a great amount of man versus man conflict, but that generally serves to drive character growth and increase or decrease the internal conflict to push Cassian and Obi-Wan past their wounds and give them meaning and purpose. Those internal conflicts are the stakes of our shows, and so far, everything is looking pretty good on both sides of the aisle. Both characters are established and defined. The audience can fairly clearly see the end goal and how our protagonist will have to struggle to reach it, neatly setting up our central source of tension for each story. Both shows also wisely establish a second source of overarching tension, the burgeoning rebellion on Ferrix and the ISB's investigation in Andor, and Reva's storyline in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Here's where the quality in the show's writing begins to stand out in how it affects the tension. Obi-Wan leans on its well-known and much-loved protagonist to draw in the audience, but it fails to create intriguing, deep, or complex secondary characters. Its central villain is inconsistently written and poorly directed, making her unintimidating and seemingly hapless, but at the same time, the show tries to convey that she is cunning and perceptive. Reva's counterpart in Andor is consistent, efficient, thorough, and ruthless. Her competence and decisiveness make her a character that we almost want to root for as she pushes against the bureaucracy and red tape that exists even within the ranks of the ISB. As far as character work goes, Andor's secondary source of tension beats Kenobi's by a mile thanks to the far superior antagonist. However, the stakes for the secondary arcs of both shows are fairly well defined. Reva wants Obi-Wan because she wants Vader, and Deidre seeks to stamp out Rebellion wherever she finds it, with her attention turning particularly to Ferrix in the final arc. We know neither of them can succeed in their ultimate quest, but they can alter events and their actions put our protagonists in situations that make us ask, how does this get resolved? So they both work fairly well. Reva's stakes are far more simplistic and grandiose, but hey, it's Star Wars. Grand ambition is kind of the name of the game. The real separation between these shows comes in how their central arcs handle the third and fourth tenets of tension, conflict, and pacing. When done correctly, the man versus man conflict of each show should serve to eventually resolve the central man versus self source of tension, and should do so in a way that is neither rushed nor drawn out. If you've seen my writing comparison of these two shows, you'll remember that we are searching for, if I may borrow a term from Aristotle, the golden mean. Each of Andor's arcs centers around a conflict that drives Cassian more and more toward rebellion, pushing him to discard his selfish, looking out for number one nature and take an active role in resisting the Empire. The first three episodes end with him being offered a choice, a chance to be more than a thief. But his hand is forced by the arrival of the Primor security forces. So instead of making an active decision to join Luthen's cause, Cassian simply goes with him because it's the path of least resistance, because Luthen offers a way off Ferrix, which Cassian suddenly needs. The Aldani arc doesn't do much to actively change Cassian's attitude, but rather, as indicated by Nemec's gift of his own manifesto, to plant the seeds for future development. Despite remaining a mercenary throughout the heist and its aftermath, Cassian comes face to face with the idealism and sacrifice inherent in members of the fledgling rebellion. And when imprisoned in Narkina V, Cassian gets a look in the mirror when he meets Kino Loy, a man who is solely focused on his own survival, and now is when the seeds of rebellion begin to sprout. The depravity and brutality of the Empire can no longer be ignored and survived, they must be challenged. Hence his incredibly powerful line at the end of the arc. And of course, Cassian's return to Ferrix and his witnessing of the events unfolding there serve to cement his status as a rebel. It's clear how each of the external conflicts affects Cassian's internal conflicts, how they slowly drive him back out of isolation and into open rebellion, lessening the show's psychological tension, but at the same time serving to gradually ramp up the secondary source of tension as we see Cassian's arc moving toward the inevitable clash on Ferrix. You'll note that I said gradually, that's important. And it's exactly what Obi-Wan Kenobi seriously lacks. Obi-Wan needs to reconnect with the Force, reckon with his failure in training Anakin, and rediscover his purpose that he somehow lost. With only six episodes, obviously the show couldn't maintain the methodical pace of Andor, but it certainly could have handled it a lot better than it did. The first three episodes are very nearly a total waste of time regarding Obi-Wan's internal conflict, 
His conversation with Nari, for example, is a wasted opportunity. Obi-Wan should have been forced to make a choice whether to aid the former Padawan or leave him to die, rather than simply giving him some general advice and depart, not knowing Nari's intentions or having any idea what would befall the young Jedi. I have a whole video on that subject, though. The only thing Episode 2 marginally accomplishes is showing Obi-Wan finding some purpose and kind of reconnecting to the Force as he channels his inner Cal Kestis for the first time in the show. But Episode 3 completely fails to build on that latter point, as he resorts to using his blaster in combat and is hilariously incompetent when fighting Vader. The show does make an attempt to grow his character in terms of finding a purpose as he bonds with Leia, but it's ham-handed and clumsy. She bosses him around after he uncharacteristically panics and then he tells the stormtroopers how much she reminds her of her mother. Ugh. It's so poorly written that it just fails the well-executed test. The worst offender, though, is of course Episode 4, in which Obi-Wan struggles to move a tiny scrap of metal with the Force, but after Tala tells him, if you care about Leia, you're gonna have to try, he arrives at Fortress Inquisitorius and then proceeds to wield his lightsaber as if he hadn't been almost completely unable to use the Force five minutes before. Sure, there's a reason he can now do what he's doing, but it happens so fast and with so little buildup that it feels rushed and contrived. Because it is. The show then repeats its error two episodes later, when Obi-Wan is inexplicably left alive beneath some rocks by Darth Vader, and now is when he discovers that he is strong enough to earthbend if he just thinks about Leia. Obi-Wan doesn't have a proper character arc. He has a character leap. Instead of gradually rediscovering his purpose and strength, he is completely helpless, unless facing off against stormtroopers because duh, until he suddenly isn't. That sudden jump discards any attempts to build tension and leaves the audience thinking, huh, that changed fast. Moving on to the final duel between Obi-Wan and Vader, on the surface there are no stakes here. Both of these characters survive. Obi-Wan has already saved the not-yet-rebels because Vader inexplicably diverted the entire Star Destroyer to chase after his former master instead of simply taking his own ship. However, there are actually psychological stakes here. Obi-Wan coming to terms with his failure. That's the reason he stays, not because he needs to kill Vader, but because he needs to know who is under the mask. So how does this reckoning of Obi-Wan's get resolved? By talking to Vader. Literally none of the duel was necessary. He could have just opened with, I failed you, Anakin. Vader would respond, Anakin is gone, and that would have been that. The lightsaber duel itself did nothing other than deliver spectacle and member berries, which is basically what the entire show was. One final note on the secondary arc's conflicts and pacing. Andor's is pretty straightforward. The ISB slowly tightens its fist around Ferrix until the powder keg explodes. It's a wonderful slow burn that has us observe the two parties concurrently, each preparing for the seemingly inevitable conflict, and we wonder who will walk away from all this. Reva's arc, which you could argue is the central one, honestly, due to how much time we spend with her and with Obi-Wan reacting to her, is more of a wobbly line. It gradually builds until episode 3, when it introduces Vader, Reva's true target, but we can't reveal that yet, so Vader is noticeably absent from Fortress Inquisitorius while Reva interrogates Leia, a scene we'll get to soon, the one person who likely knows where Obi-Wan is. Once Reva had located Obi-Wan and Vader knew of it, he should have been completely invested in every aspect of chasing down his former master, but nah, he backed off so the show could have Obi-Wan tell us Reva's true intentions. Again, it's jarring and disjointed with no real buildup, just a sudden reveal that surprised at least 12 people. Did anyone out there not call Riva being good by the end of the show? But I digress. All right, now that we've dissected each show's tension as a whole, let's zoom in on how they handled tension on a small scale within a single scene. Interrogations are some of the most tension-filled scenes in film. When done well, these scenes build tension over the course of their runtime, pulling us more and more onto the edge of our seats as the interrogators bear down on their subjects. The scenes we'll use for this comparison are, of course, Reva's interrogation of Leia from Part 4 of Kenobi, and Deidre Miro's interrogation of Bix in Nobody's Listening, Andor's ninth episode, where the latter is a gripping, bone-chilling scene that displays the depths of the Empire's depravity, the former is uninventive, generic, and an insult to interrogation scenes everywhere. Why? Well, let's start with the characters. Riva is a terrible choice for this interrogation. She is incredibly heavy-handed, as we saw with Owen, lacking a single ounce of Deidre's subtle, casual competence. This could have worked in Riva's favor if she was allowed to act in a truly brutish fashion, 
but the writers did not want her beating up Leia like how Batman clobbers the Joker in The Dark Knight, and as a result, she is forced to attempt to play the sympathetic interrogator, convincing Leia that they're all on the same side and she doesn't want to hurt anyone, which makes no damn sense because Leia saw Riva standing over the corpse of a man she just murdered in the only other scene these two have shared. This inconsistent writing of Riva's character, making her act however the script needs her to at any given moment, is just painful. Deidre suffers no such inconsistencies. She has been established as a confident, capable, and collected investigator throughout the series to this point. Her calculating clear-headedness is perfectly displayed in this scene as she calmly questions Bex. Deidre projects absolute control over the situation. No bluster, no posturing, just cool, even-handed mastery. Her demeanor emphasizes her confidence. She knows it is only a matter of time till she gets the information she wants. The stakes of any interrogation scene are easily defined. One party wants information, and the other party has it. At least, the interrogator thinks they do. Whether or not that information will change hands is the question that provides the central point of tension within the scene. This means that the information has to be relevant and meaningful. If it gets into the hands of the interrogator, that will significantly change how the story plays out. In this instance, the shows are somewhat similar. The information wanted by the respective interrogators is, on its surface, more or less the same. Both Riva and Deidre want information that will lead them to a faction of the fledgling rebellion. If their detainee gives up that information, it could lead to the Empire wielding its military might to wipe out those rebels. In Kenobi, the stakes are arguably higher. Since Leia knows exactly where the path is, due to Tala having absolutely no concept of operational security and telling her the planet where they have all the refugees stashed, it all leads to Jabim. Bix knows comparatively little. The information that she gives up is merely a small piece of the puzzle that Deidre is putting together. It helps the ISB zero in on Andor as one of the rebels at Aldani, and thus set up the dramatic conflict on Ferrix in the finale. Where the stakes in Andor are complex, and the information that Bix gives up serves to highlight Deidre's intelligence and investigative ability, the stakes in Obi-Wan Kenobi are simplistic and basic. Tell us where your rebel friends are so we can go blow them up. Where are your rebel friends now? <laughs> this generic conflict does nothing to enhance Riva's character. Unlike the arguably similar interrogation in A New Hope, there's no mind game, subtext, or existential threat here. It's just straight up, tell me where the people I want to kill are, or maybe I'll hurt you? It's the most ordinary, routine premise for an interrogation that anyone who's ever watched a movie could have written in about 15 minutes. Hey, at least if it's straightforward and simple, it should be easy to weave this interrogation scene into the overall plot, right? Remember, that's our third tenet of well-written tension. The conflict needs to address it in some way, increasing it, lessening it, etc. In Riva and Leia's scene, it just doesn't. Leia doesn't talk, despite Riva attempting to force mind-read her, and somehow not realizing that Leia's resistance is due to her being force-sensitive, but whatever. I'm long past expecting characters in this show to act logically. Frustrated, Riva sets out to torture Leia with the most third-grade bully line ever, I hope you like pain. But then gets distracted and provides Obi-Wan an opening to rescue Leia, rendering the entire interrogation pointless, neither adding nor subtracting any tension from the story. This scene didn't have to exist. The only thing it arguably accomplishes is marginally developing Leia's character by showing her capable of standing up to Riva. But since Riva is about as intimidating as a housefly, that doesn't count for much. By contrast, the Andor interrogation scene excels at building gradual tension, slowly adding to the overall suspense in the show. It serves to cement Deidre as a capable and ruthless investigator, and provides significant development for Bix's character as well. Prior to this, Bix really was no more than a thief. She was not a fish, as Deidre puts it. What we have then here is a fork in the road for Bix. She can choose to give up Cassian and Luthen willingly, sparing herself a great amount of pain, or she can resist until she is broken by the ISB's torture. Despite the end result being the same, the road which Bix takes to that destination is greatly meaningful for her character. And of course, the inevitable result of the interrogation directly plays into the Ferrix plotline, increasing tension as the ISB takes the information they have gained and turns their attention to Cassian Andor with a renewed vigor. Of course, they don't immediately jump Cassian and drive the story to a rapid conclusion. That would be inappropriate pacing that doesn't match Andor's overall method of slowly building the tension of one story arc, which will be relieved at the conclusion of that arc, but will also contribute to the growth of tension in the overarching plot. This interrogation functions as a microcosm of one of those arcs. Tension slowly builds as Deidre questions Bix, revealing her intentions, revealing how much she knows, revealing the fact that she has the means at her disposal to get what she wants out of Bix, as she did with Salman Pak. 
With each of Deidre's lines, we are pulled more to the edge of our seats as it becomes increasingly clear just how deadly serious Deidre is, and just how much she is capable of. Once the tension is brought to a head by Dr. Gorse taunting Bix with the torture she's about to undergo, it is relieved, but not in a pleasant way for Bix. And that's important. Tension need not only be reduced because a protagonist has achieved their goal, a villain getting what they want can also relieve one source of tension, even as it introduces a new one, and that's just beautiful storytelling. So how does the pacing in our Obi-Wan scene compare? To put it plainly, this scene has absolutely no sense of pacing with regards to tension. The writers don't let the suspense marinate, don't let this scene build toward anything. The tension is never given a chance to evolve. The scene simply opens with the central point of contention stated outright, and never goes anywhere from there. Reva just tries a few random techniques to coerce Leia into giving up the information she wants, then eventually gives up and resorts to inflicting pain. There's no flow to the scene, just Reva does this, and then Leia says this, then Reva tries this, and Leia says this. It's like the writers googled interrogation techniques, and then threw a few of them into the script without considering whether or not they made sense for Reva's character, or if they meshed well with each other. And the result is a disjointed mishmash of an interrogation scene that completely fails to build, maintain, or resolve any tension. I wanted to mention one more thing about these scenes that doesn't really fit into the larger categories regarding tension, but is more specific to interrogation scenes. Telling the truth. Or rather, how not telling the truth is a terrible choice for an interrogator. Riva repeatedly lies to Leia. She tells her Obi-Wan burned to death on Mapuzo. She tells her that no one is coming to save her, which maybe she thinks no one is, but she should. I mean, she kidnapped Leia in the first place because she figured Obi-Wan would get dispatched to retrieve Leia, so why would she not think he would keep trying to save Leia? Anyhow, sorry, tangent. She tells Leia that she doesn't want anyone to get hurt. Again, despite the fact that Leia witnessed the very recent aftermath of her having murdered a man in cold blood. Lying like this makes it possible for the interrogator to get caught in a lie, which significantly weakens their position. If the detainee catches their captor in a lie, that shifts the balance of power away from the interrogator and bolsters the subject's confidence and level of resistance. Deidre neatly avoids this trap by simply telling the truth. She doesn't lie to Bix because there's no need to. Deidre holds all the cards. Completely confident in her ability to get what she wants, Deidre doesn't have to attempt cheap tricks to break her subject's will. One final note on these scenes is simply an example of how Andor's writing is creative and powerful, where Obi-Wan's is bland and lackluster. I hope you like pain. The very worst thing you can do right now is bore me. Need I say more? Where Andor understood how to build and relieve tension throughout scenes, episodes, arcs, and the whole season, delivering one gripping conflict after another, Obi-Wan Kenobi failed to deliver proper pacing, a logical hero's journey, and generally did not have the writing prowess to keep the audience on the edge of their seats. Despite their surface similarities, one show relied too heavily on nostalgia and fan service while the other delivered a complex, mature, and enthralling story that has viewers eagerly awaiting season two. Well, that is it for this video. Let me know your thoughts and stick around for more such videos, as well as whatever other nerd stuff I decide to talk about. Thanks for watching!